Oscar and colleagues, now they discovered this scanning electron microscope and also electron microscope. Have known all those dots, they connected, and they did a first uh, generation of the electron microscope. From there, I think the serial developments that you see or actual inventions are already made. It's a kind of technical improvements, converting the images to digital images and also global marketing, increase, decreasing the size, increasing the resolution and all those points have been made. So this is a brief slide that shows kind of microscopes. And I think there are a lot of variety of microscopes that are available that I will again talk on the October 11th, also a little bit more in detail, technical improvements. So the important thing that you see in microscopes are basically have some kind of property. They do some kind of properties. So the bright field, dark field, phase contrast, fluorescence, of course, resolution is a wavelength of light. That is 352 to 100 nanometer. Light is the source. Confocal comes a little bit further. You aware? It's a laser, and comes the scanning and transmission. You use the not the light or a laser. You use the electrons as a beam, and comes the uh, atomic force microscope, which also constant instant, constant distance, and also scanning through microscope constant current. So. What I'm going to talk is about the super resolution microscopy on October 11th, which is also a very novel method and it's quite interesting. So when you do any kind of light microscopy, the basic property is that you use light as a source. There is a light spectrum that you can see is from here 400 nanometers in the 350, 380 nanometers to 750 nanometers. And this is a source where actually uh, point questions. Just I want to put a laser pointer. Yeah, uh, this is a light source where you use actually any kind of property. So you can see me, I can see you, we can see an object because we use light as a source. And uh, we talked about the electromagnetic spectrum that which we have a visible spectrum from 390 to 760. And other than that, you can see all kind of different types of the waves, infrared, UV rays, gamma rays, X-rays, cosmic rays, but we come exactly here in the rays of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the question comes, the differences between the optical microscopy, connection to the electron microscopy, that we use light as a source. So light microscopy, we can come up to the size, up to the one micrometer, where we can see the objects in a bigger size. But when you use the electrons as a source, you can go up to the nanometer and even up to the angstrom level. That means you can see the also the nuclear pore size, also the membrane structure that you can see with the electron microscope. The trade-off between the optical and electron microscopy is actually two things. And we need to also use electrons because that be a big resolution and also depth of focus. Uh, these are the technical terms. And I think if you're aware, it's very easy to understand. But uh, if you're not aware, I have brief some examples are there. So also a German scientist called Abeslaw uh, from the ENA University. Still, we see a nice statue there. Um, he proposed a nice hypothesis that by using the visible light as a source to see the objectives. On exactly this Abeslaw, he says that beyond that length of the visible light, you cannot go to differentiate two objectives that are less than 350 nanometers. So we use visible light as a source to distinguish between the particles that we can see between the 350 to 700 nanometers. This is what our law says. But uh, this is exactly why we got a super resolution microscope, got a Nobel Prize, because same the light source we use but still we can see the object to less than 350 nanometer. So it also needs to have a, a numerical approach. I think uh, today's world, you have all kinds of mobiles, a nice uh, zoom or uh, resolution. And what, what does all this tell about is the numerical aperture. So you see, uh, it estimates how much light from the sample is collected by the objective. And usually when you have a higher magnification, means you're having a higher numerical aperture. When you see, this is a normal glass light, 
and you put on the glass slide with the objective something in a sample. And the numerical aperture is actually the light the sample is collected by the objective. You see, this is the from here, alpha 1, alpha 2. When the light passes through the uh, sample, it hits, and the light that is returning is collected by the objective and this is called the numerical aperture. So the higher the numerical aperture, you have the higher magnification just because you collect the more emitted light. So the very important point comes the resolution. I think you're all aware about the mobile phones and you have a nice pixel. And apart from some distance, you cannot have a nice magnification just because that it's not enough sufficient. So in this scientific point of view that you talk about the resolution, meaning that between the two structures are the particles that you can able to resolve very clearly. That is the resolution. So you see here, these two structures, we can clearly resolve here is the only one structure, only one dot. And here you have the very close by structures, but you cannot resolve here. And this is the exactly main technical problem between confocal microscope and also a super resolution microscope. It means confocal microscopy that is a very beautiful, you can have a nice images, but the two particles or the two structures that are looking at are less than 350 nanometers that you cannot able to distinguish. You see the both them like these structures. And this is also artifact, you no know, interpretation. So you see here, when you have the numerical aperture, you put completely off and then the air disk is completely open. Intensity is very high. You see the structures are very blur and you put the middle of the numerical aperture, node 0 0.79. See, you can see the structures a little bit clear. And when you completely increase the numerical aperture, it means you collect the complete light. You can see the structures, individual structures very clearly. This is a resolving power. So uh, second thing comes in a little bit of physics, but still we can talk about the image diffraction because this is required for the confocal microscope. The normal light microscopic techniques, you do not have the range of diffraction because of airy disk. But if you have a confocal microscope working with, you put the airy disk, normally you put into one so that you know the diffraction will be actually neutralized. So depth of the focus or the depth of the field that you can clearly see the background here is a distracting, but if you put the depth of focus into the isolation mode, then you see the background, that's what you see in iPhone portrait mode, is exactly the same thing that you do here, <laughs> that you have here a nicer uh, vis visibility of the front end. This exact same way occurs also in the structures, because when you put an image, wanted to see on the light, you see which is not in the focus, the blur, and you try to put into the focal plane, then you see a clear structure of it. And this is also a big problem when you try to see, I think with a normal microscope, you can be able to see it, but if it is on a confocal microscope, it's a little bit difficult to get a focal plane. Yeah? So it means either you get the background or you get into focal plane, in the right focal plane, you clearly see the structures that are emitted by the light and collected by the objective. Yeah. Um, now coming to the time, a transmission electron microscope. The name it already says, the light, you say here the not the light, it is the electrons. The electrons are passing through the object tube. It means it's sample. So that's why it is called transmission. So that you can able to see the structures inside the cell or inside the object tube very clearly. So if you have a denser regions in specimen, it means you have a scattered more electrons and then they appear more darker. You can say it's a black and white movie. You go, it's exactly, you see also black and white structures. We do not have it the color uh, because the visible electrons would not fall into the visible light range. Uh, that's why it's not possible to get into the color mode. But artificially with the Photoshop, we can add the colors to make it a beautiful distinction between the structures. So how does it works? It works a stream of electrons. They're released by source, generally a tungsten or cathode, 
electro uh, electrons and they go into magnetic fields which was discovered before so that they have a very short focus and a converged beam focus that goes and it hits the samples then you have a magnetic lens of course the sample is irradiation occurs and then you have a emission of electrons and these electrons will collected by the objective and that's why you see a black and white image so very clear here this is an electron gun and there's a sample holder you have the lenses here it passes through and this is a very old electron microscope where you have a actually uh, not a, a digital images, but now actually you have a digital images. You don't need to develop or, or the photos or take the images. You can see clearly here, this is a magnetic field. So the shooter electrons will go through directly because it's in a uh, vacuum and it passes directly. So here we have a specimen grid and uh, this is a small copper shield. It's kind of mesh network, and uh, the sample is very tiny and very small, and so that you can able to see the structures very better way. So, so the former times negative, but actually we do not have negative anymore in the new ones. So the ultimate of the scientific structure that you can see is through only electron microscopy. Even though we do have other technical developments, what there still working very wonderful, but. If you want to confirm, you need to do electron microscopy. There is no other alternative. And why? Um, the research, the understanding that we are doing is everything. We do a lot of novel methods, novel techniques, uh, but you do not see the real structure, the, the two eye. The consequences or secondary reactions that can you do by the different techniques, but the real structure of a tissue or a cell that can be done only by electron microscopy. It looks very simple, but it's very also difficult. And uh, people think that, uh, yes, I can do it, but sometimes it's not also possible. The problem is that, of course, in a technique, any research, you have a pros and cons. You need to have a trade off between. So, here, first thing is that it's a laborious work. You have to generally know if you're not a patient enough. And then you think, you know, I did experiment. I won't have a result in four hours or six hours. Yeah? It doesn't work. Again, again, to repeat the thing. It's laborious. It takes at least weeks to come to know it's working or not working. And if it's not working, you do not know where it's not working. No, there are different protocols are there. You need to go through all those protocols, trying to find. So a normal person, it's not that easy to work with. So you need to have a person who are trained to understand how the system works, and then you can transform the techniques. Yeah. But second thing, as I said, this is the only one in the world so far research where you can clearly see with your own eye and believe that's the truth. And there's a reason. You can see the high range impact factor papers, which are very good papers. They will always have electron microscopy because it has that weightage. People will believe and confirm. And also when you look at it with your own eye, you will get that feeling, wow, I see a real structure inside how it is. Yeah. Now it's coming to the difference between the light and electron microscope. I think you're using the normal microscope, light microscope, they use the visible light. That is the range. But here we use electrons. I think, you know, the monochrome. The resolving power is a different one. Visible light 390 to 700, but the electrons can go up to the angstrom where you can see structures. Magnification understandable. Source here is the halogen lamp where you see the you generate the light, but here we use the high voltage tungsten lamp or cathode lamp. Of course, light microscope is a glass. Here you use the magnets because of the converging of the electrons into a focus beam. Uh, we can use both, we can use with human eye. It's also one of the fantastic, both we can use with human eye. The light microscope, we can also cell culture, you can put under the microscope and you can see there's also live cell imaging, which is very nice, where you can track the things. But these things are all labeled with some other antibody or some dye, but you don't see the real structure. But with the electron microscope, unfortunately, we don't see the light, we can only see the dead ones. So this could be a, a kind of a one of the negative part, you see the real structure, 
but this is not live this is dead so it means you're looking at the dead things this could also happen after the death of the thing something could happen that we do not know right there could be also generation of artifact so for that electron microscope there is a technical development called freeze sectioning or freeze part it means you can say it's almost like a dead but not living it's a semi way of working because electron microscopy you need to do fixation so fixation which is the one actually makes to alter the structure of the cells or the membranes we do not know the physical properties after fixation how it changes so to avoid that is freeze and thaw method that you don't fix with any chemicals rather you fix with water interesting right like you to put something anything in frozen where you want to eat later similarly you use your samples which is a frozen but not minus 20 under minus 170 the frozen thaw and then after you look it into the cryo environment so this is developed to avoid the fixation which is pretty good it's also very laborious very expensive and technical all limitations are also there but still we can able to see the living structure i show you one image where we did with the uh, cryo section so we do the embedding wax or resin microtome i will also show how the microtome works and the staining works with heavy metals is the uh, osmium tetroxide or potassium ferromagnet and then instead of the normal light microscope you do the objective slides but here you have a copper grids so uh, this is the one part which is very interesting it's also can kind of overview about the fixation so anything that you see is fixed it's exactly i showed you before i told you before uh, fixation could also alter the structure of the properties of the cell which is also proven when we do not have any alternative anything goes with fixation either they do staining or dissection or anything it goes with fixation so what is fixation how does it work so fixation means general routinely we use para formaldehyde or glutaldehyde glutaldehyde goes very well with electron microscopy because of better contrast and para formaldehyde goes very well with the light microscopy four percent generally is very good there are also various other ways of fixation that you regularly like a methanol acetone cellulose also various with the alcohol you can use many ways but uh, most favorable fixation is the uh, 4% formaldehyde so what does it do this para formaldehyde will go and cross link between the aldehyde groups of the proteins so you have another statue so that versus statue so there are various ways how you fix the sample you can see the chemical fixation and then physical fixation chemical fixation you do with the para formaldehyde or glutaldehyde or without only para formaldehyde with the glutaldehyde i mean there are so many ways and this also takes a lot of time to understand for your sample for which is shows how which is a proper fixation and once you fix the samples it goes with the dehydration so that you dehydrate the water remove the water and you embed for the electron microscope we use the epon or for to check the ultra structure use a regular epon but if you want to do labeling a different antibody labeling then you have to use lr white and then you go for a regular microtome it's called ultra microtomy and then you cut and you look under the microscope so physical fixation this is what i talked about before it means to you do not use any kind of chemicals rather use directly the cryo ultra microtomy you frozen with 170 degrees minus and you directly cut it under the again cryo uh, microtome or you froze it and then again embed with the kind of a resin and then you cut under the ultra microtome so this is a laborious process and uh, this has to be just not taken as you read it in the literature it has to be personalized as your requirement so the most important thing also whether you need to perfuse the animal yes or no because perfusion is very very important 
because the time that you do isolate the organ go for the fixation, the structure is already changed. So you need to take this fixative, chemical fixative, and you need to produce the animal so that it goes into the blood circulation, removes the erythrocytes and fix the structure and you isolate and do again fixation. These are very, very small, tiny things, but actually in the end alters a complete structure. So it's a typical resin that you embed. I think you might have seen the paraffin blocks. That's a regular way for the light microscopy. And these are the uh, resin blocks and uh, you need to trim. So the structure will be here in the corner. It's all the epoxy resin. Once this is dried for three days in the 45 degrees in the incubator, it's like a molded and you cut them into a shape called a trimmer, I'll show you. And uh, once you cut, once you have the, the trimmer, this is like this, and you cut the tiny 70 to 100 nanometer thin slices of the tissue with the diamond. So generally we use diamond, but here for the cost effective, you can take any kind of glass, cut into the shape of triangle, and you can use the sharp edge of the glass as a diamond knife to cut the, this thin grain. So this is a ultra micro tomb, typical ultra micro tomb, where you can put this grid into here and set the settings now, which is a very also modern ultra micro tomb. It cuts automatically. So it's not a manual, it's automatic. Just you need to set everything and it does its job wonderfully. You can see the you can set all kind of buttons here, the thickness, how much you want to have it. And also uh, you can also see the thing, the magnification is everything is automatic. And then the finally you have a very nice thin up to 70 to 100 nanometer uh, thin sections of the liver tissue or the sample. So this swimming is very important. You see, this is the sample and this is the tissue before the part. And uh, once you trim the part, the tissue is exactly cut into the difficult one where what we have shown before and it's exactly before this section here. And then you can put this one into the ultra microtome and it makes a nice thin section. So generally, if you use by the hand, you see under the ultra microtome or a glass knife, both the same, you get up to the 7200 nanometer, very thin slices of your sample. So how you can see if it's a good or bad, generally you put under the water, these thin slices, they reflect a different light. So brown to gold when these thin sections. When the thin sections are very good, you see in the gold pattern, it means around 60 to 70 nanometer. And they're very thick, 100 or more than 100, it's a little bit of brown color. So just by virtue, you cut it under the water, you see how this emission, and you can see nice ones. Even though you set for the 70 nanometer size to cut it, but you know, machines, you never know, right? Really, they give 70 nanometer, or they can give even higher. So these are the copper grids. These copper grids are coated with some kind of coating called foam bar coating, so that these thin, very slices, they're actually on these copper grids, so that actually it goes into the electron microscope. So right, now we have the thin sections on the copper grid, and we take this one into the electron microscope, and you see on the electron microscope structure. So it's a very good technical thing is that when you have these copper grids, it's a very nice one. Uh, you need to bake them for 20 minutes in the electron microscope so that it pass through the electrons and it will be able to half cooked like a pizza, you cook it half in similar way also it's half cooked. And once it is there, then you can put them on it, the, our sample, then I, sometimes the sample hits, uh, the electrons hits the sample, it will break everything. So in order not to break the sample, you put coating as a kind of a support. So coming to the, now the scanning electron microscope, I think uh, you already already saw that one here. It's working very well. Yusuf is a very nice technique guy. He's working very well. And 
you see a lot of nice, wonderful surface structures. So the name itself says scanning electron microscope. It means it does not go through the tissue or the cell, rather it scans the surface, the main major thing, yeah? Once you scan it, then you see the surface. The question comes, what is the importance? So I need to see the surface, right? So um, I think uh, it was last 15 years, you can say, a very good technical development of understanding about surface, just not only in the science, in all the fields. And now at the moment, scanning electron microscope is a very crazy. Everybody's working with that because you wanted to see the surface, how it works. Yeah. And just any kind of designing, you know, any kind of designing, any new product, anything that you launch that you want to see the how the structure is, they do scanning electron microscopy. So transmission will work mostly in the science, but uh, them will work in all industry, doesn't matter, because you want to surface, especially um, any com pharmaceutical company wants to design a beautiful cream, anti-aging, for example, for the women or men also, most for women, um, then they want to see how deep the cream is penetrating. And once you put the cream, how the skin is looks like, for example, in terms of production right? Or if you work with the nanoparticles or hydroxyapatite particles, when they design the new nanoparticle, the drug delivery, when you put how actually the nanoparticle size they look like, the first creation of nanoparticles, how they look like, do they have a structural difference on the surface? When you enter nanoparticles, where they are going, how they are touching with other things, is they altering their shape and structure? But the important thing is that you have a skin or surface composition of suppose membrane lipids or anything else or any other structures do they have any kind of alteration just one thing and the second thing for our scientific point of view when you see how the structure looks like once we have the sem then we can try to see what is inside okay so this is what you see in comparison to laborious process of electron microscopy time, this is very simple preparation. You don't need to have so much of the work. It goes in a half day, you're done with the sample preparation. And another half day, I mean, maximum one day or eight hours, you're done with the work actually, and you have the results. So easy sample, and you need to have big samples. The bigger is the better for them, and the smaller is the better for the time. So you see chemistry, crystallography, orientation of brains, inside to topography, morphology, many, so many. Now metallomics, metals, alloys, um, crystals, stones, you know, all the way the use actually same. Yeah, um, how do we get an image? So these are the very important, I think this can be also used for the time also. When the electrons are coming in and hitting the specimen, there is a generation of a variety of uh, electrons, variety of emitted the uh, elements. That's what you see. You have a auger electrons, X-rays, cathode luminescence light, and also backscattered and secondary electrons. So these two are the ones, backscattered and secondary electrons. Secondary electrons are the one, actually they're very near to the nanometer, near to the sample. And then backscattered electrons are next to the secondary electrons that are a little bit away to the sample. So when you collect the secondary electrons and also back the electrons, automatically you get an image of a topography or a structure of the surface of the sample. And the more electrons coming up from the sample, you collect it and you make an image out of it. And that's what you get an image. So similar technique that you also use in the super resolution but not ultrastructure level, you use the light, but similar way, you also use the super resolution microscope, which I will tell you on October 11th. Yeah, so time is a little bit expensive because of laborious process, uh, and also it needs high energy of electrons. A sem is in comparison to time, it's relatively cheap and easy to work with. So I chose some examples here that have uh, been working for many years, and uh, it's very interesting. The more you understand, the more you know, it's quite fascinating. It's about the mouse lung. 
transmission electron microscopy because you see the structure of the cell. So I was working at the time with the catalyst. My favorite organelle is the peroxisomes. I have also talked about, I talked about these peroxisomes. They're interesting. They're almost in every cell, but we do not know what they're doing and why they are there. Uh, trying to understand, this is the whole my career started with this organelle. And this is my PhD stuff. And I'm still working with the same organelle more than 20 years now. And it's, it's so much of technical development and understanding when you work with only one research point for many years. Yeah, so I was trying to establish them to understand about this organelle. That was my PhD thesis. It took me for six years because I need to establish the term, SEM, and also to understand the methods for the organelles. So this is a very laborious process, but when you work your own yourself, then you understand how things are working and it's a lot of fun. So you see here, the granules here, the secretary granules of the non ciliated cells, and this is a nice mitochondria. And we see, we knew from the books that mitochondria looks like that. But when you look your own, mitochondria looks quite different. And mitochondria differ from cell to cell. It's quite interesting. But even though all our mitochondria, they're different. And why? We don't know. So don't worry. There are so many questions that we do not know. We see in the books, so much written books. And I think this is still less. And I would say many things that we do not know yet. So you people have to work on it to make to know understand why they are. And you see, these are the two structures or the paroxysms that you see with the tongue. And I thought, okay, they're wrong. This which is on the literature, but I also see a very nice elongated paroxysms that you cannot see with any kind of method. You can see the Western blood, you see the protein, but you do not know whether it's round or elongated or tubular that you see structures on here. So we see very nice, see here the wrong, but here the elongated paroxysms. And you also see different sizes in different cell types. That's also interesting. You see a, a alveolar type two cell, type one cell, endothelial cell, and also endothelial cell bordering with type one cell. They're all different cell types in the same region of here, one cell. And they look, all the paroxysms are quite different in sizes. And that also tells, like we also in different sizes because we are same age, but the, up to the 18 years, you grow up the mind. In a similar way, these proxims also have a kind of a age and they live for three days. So third day, they die and come to you one. You can see this is a, very, this is a typical pattern of a paroxysm having a head and a tail. And this is actually how the paroxysms are in the cell. But what you see here, and why you see here only wrong. For that, you do not need to have any kind of understanding, just logical thinking. No science is required. You see very elongated here and then here, but you see only here wrong. Why? Yeah, it's a cross section. It's a cross section. Yeah, if you cut it here and you see from that point, you also see the wrong. So this is actually the natural way how the paroxysms are in our body, in the cell. But most of the time we see 99%, we see only all the time they are wrong. Just because we cut through the section or a sample or a cell and we see from other angles. And it's quite difficult to get a complete proxum in a focal plane. Not only proxum, any other organelle. It's like that. So it's an invitation, the way you look at the things, the way you understand. And this is exactly what the main thing is about seeing is believing that what you look at and what you believe, apparently not. There is so much left that you need to clarify. So it's a macrophage. We know by nature, by biology, macrophages have a function, phagocytosis, phagocytosis occurs through lysosomes. So typical property, they should have the lysosomes. So these are the lysosomes. If you have a lysosome, then you're right, it is a macrophage. If you're not a lysosome, then it's not a macrophage. You're looking at some other cell. So one of the difficult part of the term is also, you need to have a very good understanding about the cell biology. Because 
when you cut it, when you look at the microscope, you don't know where you are. Don't you don't even know anything. You need to have anatomy. You need to have a histology and cell biology, and then you can understand actually where you are. And to interpret. So having work is one thing. You can say ninety percent of the laborious work, and another ninety percent actually interpretation. It's the most difficult part. Yeah. These are the two different animals, wild type and knockout, of the same cell. But you see a big difference between these cells. So this is a wild type, and this is a knockout. The gene is not there. And when you don't have this sex eleven beta gene, these animals die immediately. So we do intrauterine. It means taking both from the uterus, since the animals are living, and cut them, embedded them on embryonic ninety day before the delivery, and then look under for the microscope. So the whole process that took almost you know three weeks to have this kind of an image. And when you see the image, it's one in the lifetime. You never get this kind of image anywhere, and nobody can be able to produce it. And you see very clear differences. And this is only one image. After the fifteen years of research is going on, just basing on this image, the whole projects were designed. Pitched and postdocs, grants, and everything, and still we are working on because just based on this, because this is hundred percent correct, and we can rely on it, and we try to see why we see this, but these projects are not yet completed. Still, is going on. It's fifteen years work. My PhD work. Yeah, the difference what you see here, a nice type two cell, microvilli. Lamellar bodies, glycogen. So glycogen is very important because these are E19 animals. As soon as the babies deliver, they need to have the food, and even uh, litters can live up to four to five days. You know, we thought they do not even eyes, but they can suck the mother's milk. If they do not find the mother, still they can live and survive just because they have a nice glycogen inside. We need some. It's a food reserve, and that you see also very nice. Glycogen and also lamellar bodies and a nucleus, typical structure of a healthy cell. But exactly that are missing here. You do not have the lamellar bodies. If you do not have the lamellar bodies, you do not have a respiration. Lungs collapse at expiration. If you do not have lamellar bodies, lungs collapse means you have a respiratory distress syndrome. Animals die. This is what is happening. And why you do not have lamellar bodies? Why you don't have microvilli here? Why you have molecular glycosin here? So all these questions will come up, and you make the project. Similarly, also when you look into the tissue, you understand the macroscope clearly that animal is dying. I do not know why the animal is dying, from where it is coming. So I'm looking at only the lung tissue, one cell, but lung has forty different cell types. So which cell I have to look? What is happening there? Forty cells. And out of the forty cell types, only five cell types are very good research. Not under percent, a little bit of research is going on the whole world about five or six cell types. And about other thirty-three cells, we don't even know anything. Actually, why they are there? That's what I say. Many things are open. We do not know how it works. So this is about the endothelial cells, especially our from our top. Endothelial cells are isolated. And these cells were again fixed by the electron microscopy. It's also it's not that easy to isolate the endothelial. The results are good. And from there, you need to get in isolate the endothelial cell. And again, then you embed them. And we say typical structures of the endothelial cell. This is cell structure. And we fix them, not the tissue. And you see nice nucleus and also typical vesicular bodies, also typical signs for the endothelial cells. There you can see that we do have a typical infrastructure of the endothelial tissue nuclei, and also in the cells you see one endothelial cell connecting to the other endothelial cells. That exactly you see the connections, cell-cell contacts. Then you have kind of you know simulation how the cell looks like in the cell, the tissue or body. That's what exactly you see here. Coming to the mouse liver. The typical part, the structure that you see also very beautiful, nice mitochondria, 
and liver is a very metabolic organ, highly active. You can see by virtue, all these cells are hepatocytes are very active because of biosynthesis and also our toxic degradation continuously going on and the, all the blood goes to, venous blood goes to the liver before it comes into the body. And that's why you see all the cells are active. So active means, of course, a very good nucleus and also very active mitochondria and other organelles like peroxidomes that we see very clearly here. Erythrocyte and endothelium. And of course, the peroxisomes. So this is what you see a typical structure of a liver with the temp. And we optimize, I think, again, three to yeah, four years, I would say, four years, and to get this image. This is again the mouse liver, but a different fixation. You see now. And this is not at all edited by any Photoshop. It's a real image. That's what you see very clear, beautiful, all cell structures. Instant fixation. Block fix technique, where you fix it. You can see beautifully, very nice nucleus. What are these structures here? Anybody could tell why it is a, a little bit of bright and a bit of dark. Why? What are these structures? Why it is bright here? Why it is dark here? And it's a nuclear membrane. Yeah, it's a nucleus. It's a nuclear membrane. And this is all the cytoplasm. And you see around the nuclear membrane, you have a border dark. You see every here dark, here dark, here dark, here dark. But here is a bright. Yes, you can guess. No problem. Nothing goes wrong. What does it matter? Dense. No, no, no. Yeah, the dense is required. That's absolutely true. The electron dense is higher that you see the structures. Absolutely. But what are these? Why the electron dense is higher there? What are these structures? That's true. Good observation. Why is dark and why it is bright? So you can see the cytoplasm is very active, right? It's like a traffic jam. Yeah. So many cars are going on the street. It's so full. The cell is very. The cell is very active. Hepatocyte. If the cell is active, mean this is skeleton. It has to trigger from the nucleus. Otherwise, they don't have the job. Everything has to come from the nucleus. Then only it can work. It means nucleus has to work on. Nucleus cannot do anything. Everything works by the chromosomes, right? Where the chromosomes are stored and the heterochromatin. And this dark part is the heterochromatin. So heterochromatin has to release towards those spiralized. Then the brighter part is euchromatin. So this euchromatin is actually functional one. Information is this information has been read by the euchromatin and then transcription that occurs here in the nucleus. And this is what's happening here in the white part. Once the transcription occurs, of course, generation of the mRNA and that goes into the cytoplasm. Once it comes in cytoplasm, the mRNA will be taken by the, for the synthesis of the proteins, by the endoplasmatic ribosomes and then endoplasmatic reticulum. So that's what you see that then when the, the proteins are synthesized, you need to have the Golgi for the glycolation. So everything comes from the euchromatin, heterochromatin, euchromatin. And this is a euchromatin, this is synthesized, very active, continuously transcription occurs, comes into cytoplasm, and you have a nice perinuclear cistern that you see here, and you have a nice mitochondria, Complete see very beautiful mitochondria with the crystal tape. And these are all the ribosomes, and also endoplasmic reticulum. These are all the ribosomes and the lipids and the granules. So this that tells if you see look at the nucleus, it's an active hepatocyte. 
it's completely dark, it's inactive. And you can also see the mitochondria, the typical tubular mitochondria, or very elongated mitochondria that tells the synthesis of the steroid synthesis, the very tubular. There is no steroid synthesis occurs, the normal elongated mitochondria. You can see the crystal. See the Golgi, very really beautiful here, nice mitochondria. And that's what you see here. A stripe is going on here. I put them intentionally here. What could be the stripe? So this is the artifact. So when you cut with the knife, sometimes the knife also has the layers, right? The tissue. And this is what that you see here. And uh, of course, for a publication, you don't put this kind of image, but for understanding that you can put it, and this very often occurs. And also, I showed, I did not show the real images, which are also oh, a lot of holes inside because the tissue breaks in the time. You know? But you can see, so this is heterochromatin here, also heterochromatin here, and this is also euchromatin, very active cell. You can see very nice, beautiful structure of the mitochondria now here, with the crystal. And the important thing, two membranes that you can clearly able to distinguish. Yeah, it's not that easy to see two different membranes. See very clearly. You need to have very good contrast. And you can see one mitochondria is attaching to other mitochondria, and you have some mitochondrial complex proteins. Yeah, it's kind of you know giving the information from one mitochondria to other mitochondria. They also communicate each other. Come the heart, the typical structure of the heart. And you look here, just you have seen the nice, beautiful mitochondria here. And you see the mitochondria, how they look like. That's a liver, oh, that's a heart. Exactly mitochondria. Mitochondria has the same function in the whole body. The structures are different. And these are the normal, typical muscle, heart muscle, skeletal muscle, heart muscle. Cardiomyocytes, and from the cardiomyocytes, you see in between the layers, you have a typical mitochondria. They are going through continuously. Yeah, we are trying to understand the one project. A Bart syndrome, and in the Bart syndrome patients, mostly occurs with the children, and they develop cardiomyopathy, and it goes to heart failure. And what, we know that there's a problem with the mitochondria, but uh, people didn't even look at the take them the microscope. And we're trying to understand what, what happens in this mouse heart. So we have a nice mouse model, and uh, they develop at after 12 weeks, these animals will get Barth syndrome. So you can clearly see this difference in the normal healthy animal and a Barth syndrome. Animal, you can see a typical proliferation of mitochondria and structural changes in the Bart syndrome. See, these are membrane stacks. This is mitochondria. In the middle, you have a central vacuole. Membranes are stacking together. Crystal is completely swollen. And this is doesn't look like a healthy mitochondria. Right? And then you see in the normal, there is a problem with mitochondria, but we don't know how they look like. And what they do. Yeah. And we see also the peroxomes are very nearby to the mitochondria and they have a proliferation in these animals. And then we come to a hypothesis based on these images that you see in the normal healthy heart, you have a many mitochondria and also many peroxisomes. But in the Tafat seed knockdown, where you generate this mouse model, Bart syndrome, there is a proliferation of mitochondria. And then also swollen uh, proliferation of peroxisomes, sorry, and it's swollen mitochondria. So this indicates that the mitochondrial function is impaired because they're not healthy. And the job of the mitochondria has been taken by the peroxisomes because they are living or residing very close, less than 20 to 50 nanometers. That's hypothesis. So it comes to the next one. This is a Post embedding immunocytochemistry, also TEM. It's a very beautiful method. 
also very informative because you try to label a protein and looking at under transmural chromatography, a clear labeling. And this will tell a beautiful information actually. So regularly you do antibody labeling in a similar way, but you do at the at microscopic level. So it means every structures are very small, very in elaborated protocols, because any kind of artifact that you see very clearly in a bigger map, it should be free from all the artifacts. So these are the gold particles. There are three or now four different gold particle sizes, ranging from nanometer, six nanometers to 15 nanometers that coupled with antibody. And when they couple with antibody, like any primary antibody that you do, regular staining, and you stain them, they couple with them, and you put under the microscope and see. So this example for the catalyst, you can see nice lamellary bodies, mitochondria, and also a very clear staining for the catalyst on the matrix of the peroxisome. There you can see, rest everything is negative, only where the protein is bound. And that shows a clear sensitivity, also specificity. So clearly see reaction specific and accurate. So this protocol and procedure is completely different. Starting from the procedure till ending is completely different to what that you do. The question comes, the seeing is believing. That's what I said before already. If you have the structures between two structures that are very close by, but the distance between these two structures is less than 150 nanometer, you see it as one. And that often occurs in a microscopy. Unfocal microscopy is wonderful. You get very beautiful images. And this is also published. You see very beautiful thin sliced images. But what the problem is that what you see is exactly true. See, you see these are the two different proteins, like a mitochondrial protein, superoxide dismutase 2, and then catalase. When you label them both, they look actually in two different compartments, green and red. This is the nucleus. Green is very clear, and red is very clear. They are completely separate. Sometimes, when you look at them, they come very close by. For some regions, you see they are yellow. Yeah? See, for example, here. For example, here. For example, here. It means when they come very close by, you cannot differentiate, and you come to as a kind of a co localization. And you don't do the electron microscopy, you publish or you interpret that the unknown protein is co localizing to my interest cell or tissue or organ. Right? Interpretation comes. And this was already happened, it's already published. That this protein, superoxidismutase 2, is actually mitochondrial protein, but they also showed that this is also a paroxysmal protein that which disturbed me. I think this is not a paroxysmal protein. They somehow interpreted based on these kinds of images. So we tried again to understand no, this is not a paroxysmal protein, rather, it is a mitochondrial protein, but I need to prove that this is a mitochondrial protein. So we took the liver and did the catalyst labeling specifically to make sure that it's very clearly labels. We know this method, it works. And it's a liver and all the mitochondria are negative and then peroxomes are very clearly labeled. Took again, same on the sections, superoxide is between two. And again with the seven nanometer gold particles and we label them. You see the mitochondria are completely positive and peroxomes are negative. And the difference between them is less than 350 nanometers. It's exactly what you see. They're very close nearby. The SO2 is clearly labeled here. And then peroxisomes nearby here is not actually labeled. Mm -hmm. And this is also, you see a clear structure here. A, a black stripe is going on. And this is also a core, crystal core of the peroxisome. And this is also one way you can clearly identify the peroxisomes. And this is also very nice, beautiful cryo EM that I told you before. This also tells you a different texture, a real texture of your organelle, because you see this is a fixed tissue and this is a frozen tissue. There you can see a clear differences. 
this is natural pattern of peroxum how in our body looks like mitochondria looks like these also yeah beautiful structures and this is a change in the texture of the organs or uh, uh, cell structures this is the liver and also try it so maybe thought the liver could be separate but maybe lung this is not the case so try it also other organ to make sure that these two are different structures not one structure you can see here a nice mitochondrial labeling but peroxins were quite free and the distance is less than 300 feet that's actually the problem good coming to the scanning of microscopy and the different lung stages why i put the lung stages because as soon as the mouse born newborn mouse till to the development of course you can say six weeks it's adult and of course we also grow like the animals animals also grow how structures change during the development it's very interesting this is a newborn lung so we see the structural point of view and uh, you see the nice this is bronchial terminals or the terminal bronchioles and part of the conductive part of the lung and then after from the respiration part and end part of is actually the change in the structure because the gas exchange comes from outside to our trachea the bronchus comes to bronchiole the terminal bronchioles there actually ends and then comes the respiration part with the alveole so trying to look the because this is a kind of a junction where the function of the part changes and we'll see the newborn mouse lung we see the terminal bronchioles very small and you see also very beautiful what are these structures so these are the club cells and these are the ciliated cells they have a cilia right that ciliated cell yeah so this is the way that it looks like here the complete lung lobe the adult lung is a complete lung lobe fixed embed simple brain and then after you cut through the part in the half and you see from the up the whole structures how they are so this is a typically the terminal bronchioles here this is a vessel and these are all the alveoles here and when you see here the typical bronchioles it's like a closed tube but you cut into half so it is open and you're looking from the front and this is the lining of the helmet bronchioles and when you highly magnify you can see beautiful structures columnar cells and these are the club cells and in between the club cells you have a beautiful ciliated cell so we have only two cells mainly which most of the research is going on ciliated cells and then club cells so in the air magnification you can clearly appreciate a beautiful structure here coming up there these are the newly just on the bond these ciliated cells they have the life cycle of the six weeks so there is a continuous generation of these epithelial cells and these are already mature club cells and between you have the ciliated cells yeah so you see some differences here right these are the terminal bronchioles so it's kind of you know end part of the whole gas exchequer this is a proximal part and you see there are less epithelial cells and of course i mean the club cells but more cilia makes sense right because the function yeah from outside you get the air air of course contains a lot of oxidants and also trap all kind of materials are there and the upper part contains the proximal part should be broader so we should have more cilia makes sense because of congestion engulfment or any kind of bacteria the cilia can trap the air yeah and that's why we see and this is the nature right how they generate it but to make it their function and the cell structure also depends upon the function of the tissue and you can see very clearly a very elongated cilia and then also small cilia is coming up again here see very beautiful so tremendous cilia right and we're trying to understand how the cilia developing 
ciliar structures are coming up. And before, it was not the case about the cilia. I think maybe 70, 10 years ago. Cilia plays a very important role. And if you remove one of the genes of the cilia development, actually the you get animals die off. So they cannot even, cilia cannot move. And especially we have a nice studies done in the in vitro. We have taken out this ciliated uh, cells into the culture. And you put some dust into the culture. And the ciliated cells move. They move. And then within the time frame, they collect all the dust into a corner. And we have a healthy and a knockdown, one of the gene knockdown. And we put both in the cell culture and put the dust. And life is amazing. You can see clearly how the gene is helping the cilia to move on. It's a similar condition. If you have smoke or you have, it's a continuous inhalation of the smoke. And then the cilia is not healthy. Of course, you collect all the smoke in the track here. And of course, the aggression of course, the aggressiveness of the disease starts. Yeah. So this is also this a post embedding immunocytochemistry. You label a typical cell uh, with club cells in the corner here. You can see the border, ciliated, ciliated cell, and the non ciliated cell. Very nice labeling. So this is again to the Dr. Heavy. Wonderful with use of together. Just wanted to show the brief examples of the SEM from here. I mean, we published many publications after the SEM established here, but this is one of the work just would like to briefly give a kind of an insight. So Dr. Heavy is working basically with the hung, hung of the different animals. Here is a, a horse field. And then trying to understand the anatomy and then structure of the tongue. Of course, we know the tongue is a wonderful organ. Where before that, we cannot really you know, enjoy the food. All different taste buds are there. So puppy lip, and then trying to understand the animal structures, how they develop and there. So this is the anterior apex of the tongue. The Stupia javanica is from papillae. And you see this is a, a we, we have a conical papillae, fungi from papillae, and also small papillae. And that's what you can see the, all these structures here. And then you go into the further, that you can see the different structures. You can see the conical papillae here. Yeah, the front. And here's a fungi from papillae here. And it's a corn flower filly from papillae. And uh, this is a rosette filly because of the form, not the structure, the rosette. And you go further, that is see so beautiful images that you can see the surface. And here is actually the volatile papillae. And here you have a conical papillae going on. And when you see even higher magnification, of this papillae, especially the volatile papillae and conical papillae, you can feel like a structures. This small filiform like structure of the papillae. So we are working with the tongue of the different uh, animals, and we see a very beautiful anatomy and also structural changes of different animals. And this is also evolution. Yeah. And uh, this way we can understand how the structures were being made and how these functions are actually for making a biological property in the of anatomy again. So it's very wonderful working to know the structures. And again, I say many things we do not know yet. I can tell you briefly, maybe I can also show you about the, my talk later. It's very interesting. Mm. All the my research I'm working is that I'm the only one. I Even the world is so big, so many groups working on. In the field I'm working on, there is no competition and nobody's working. And I tell you, every cell we have is organized, in every cell. And we have millions of cells and we have many organs. And in each cell, it is there except platelets. So the discovery that the platelets do not have the proxons, but I showed now, no, it's wrong. Platelets also have proxons. Not it published? Was something new. Um, and erythrocytes do not have it. And also late spermatids. Spermatids develop spermatocytes, then you don't have the proxy. 
other than these two cell types in all the cells, even the oocytes, we thought that spermatocytes do not have this problem, assuming that uh, oocytes also do not have it, but apparently we found it. So we do not know why it is there, why it is not there. And when it is there, what it is doing, we do not know the function. So as soon as say, we say structurally, one property is there, one structure it is there, assuming in the evolution, it has a biological function. Otherwise, in the evolution, it will, be away. It will not be anymore. Yeah. But when it is there, so we need to find the function. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you for your attention and looking forward to your questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Karnati, for your incredible presentation. So for the next session, we will go for discussion. So for all of the participants here, if you have any questions to Professor Karnati, you can raise your hand so that I can hear you and give you the microphone. Is there any question? Uh, okay, uh, first, thank you uh, for the opportunity and it's a good opportunity to her presentation from uh, you, Professor. Uh, I have a question about the staining material. Uh, what kind of staining material you prefer to use uh, for the stem analysis? Please again, please. What, uh, what kind of uh, stain? Staining material. Ah, staining material. Staining material. Yeah. Uh, but the, before I answer the what type of staining method, rather what you want to look at it. Okay. So first the question is, before choosing the staining method, because you can stain the lipids, you can stain the membranes, you can stain the nucleus, you can stain glycogen. You can do a lot of staining methods. But actually what you want to look at, you want to look at a general routine histology, or you're looking for a specific protein? That's the first question. What you want to look at? Uh, the membrane cell. Uh, I I have a plan to observe the disruption of membrane, a bacterial membrane cell. A bacterial membrane? Yeah. So the, if you want to look at the mem mem bacterial membrane, then you look for the membrane proteins. Yeah. And uh, that for the bacterial thing, I think you can look at the just light macroscopy. If the disturbance is the membrane that you can see it, bacterial membrane. But if you want to label them with immunofluorescence, is the right thing. Is it cell or tissue? Is it a cell or tissue? Uh, cell. A tissue, sorry. Tissue. Tissue. Yeah. I think tissue should be the one of fixation. A normal fixation with 4% parapartamaldehyde. Cut them a normal section. Um, I think uh, if you want to look at the membrane, the thickness of the section is not so much important. You can go up to a micrometer, but if the your structure of interest is smaller, then I think you need to make a thin section. It makes a very big difference if the section of the tissue section is. 10 micrometer or 2 micrometer. So if the structure of your interest is smaller, tiny organelle or anything else, you need to go to 2 micrometer. A routine histology, 10 micrometer. And I think for your interest, 5 micrometer size enough. You can adjust the microtome, 5 micrometer, then you cut the tissue. And the first is a routine histology to look at whether the whatever your intention is everything okay. And once you say the structures of the whole region or your interest, then you can go with a, a proper immunofluorescence. Immunofluorescence meaning you go with a 4% parafarmacy in the tissue and then cut with the 5 micrometer size and go for the primary antibody and secondary antibody conjugated one and the two tar staining or hook staining to see another microscope, fluorescent microscope. Um, is your interest of your membrane 
you want to see the whole membrane or the one of the membrane protein? Uh, I want to the membrane disruption. That's that's a, that's the okay, perubahan. The membrane yeah, the changes, the changes of the the membrane structure. Membrane structure. Yeah. Yeah. Then I think then it, I think. If there are if there are if there are very big differences in the membrane structure, uh, then only we can see with the normal histology. But uh, with the light microscopy, I would not show sure you can able to check it. But you can see any kind of membrane proteins, cadherins. That is, you can clearly see label them very easy to find the cadherins. That uh, if there are alteration occurs, you can see immediately. Any kind of membrane protein, there are many membrane proteins that you can beautifully label them. Not so much of the uh, technical problems there. Yeah. Thank, thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Karnati, for answering the question. For the next question, we have it on the chat box. Ah, oh, yeah. From Mystery. The question is. If we want to evaluate the growth of cell or stem cells in the bioscaffold or tissue engineering, should we use SAM or any ordinary fluorescence microscope? If using the SAM, what fixative material was recommended? So as not to damage the cell that already attached to the bioscaffold. Uh, very good question. Again, uh, the question comes for the bioscaffold. Yeah, I think. Uh, it's difficult to see the surface of a bias scaffold. I think better I would focus in the first to fix the material and check under the fluorescence microscope. Um, I think once this occurs with the fluorescence microscope, we can see the different scaffolds of the uh, tissue. Then I would go for the SEM. SEM would not damage the tissue. Anyway, the you grow, it's a cell culture. You can grow them in the culture. If you collect a kind of you know, big organoid in a big size, then you can make the stem. Um, I think uh, I would, again, I would much focus once you have the fluorescence microscope, you know what actually you're looking at because bioscaffolds for tissue engineering, of course, stem is the one. Then I would go for the TEM. Hmm? About the growth of the cell. So we anchored them together, but we here. So the fixed station is the same, the glutaral the height, but uh, the uh, homework is to identify in details. Because if we just know, oh, it's growth, it's it's good, we can see clearly. But if we want to know if the cell is uh, tend to apoptosis or no, we need to explore in the more higher magnification so we can see in the surface. Because usually the cell, if it's not good, they have uh, like a blubbing in the surface uh, of the cell. Uh, we ever tried once the, our last work with the cancer cell, the, 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 the paper that I sent to you, that and you give me idea to have a look in the more magnification. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, for the next question is from Ms. Ani Nurliani. The question is, like you mentioned before, one of the chemical used in fixation is osmium tetoxide. As we know that this chemical is very toxic. How the safety procedure when we use it for the sample preparation in same or time? Uh, thank you for asking this question. Uh, I did not cover the technical part for the SEM or the TEM. Uh, osmium tetroxide is a carcinogen, it's also very toxic. There are very wonderful ways how you can reach, how must you have to recycle it. Um, maybe if you directly write me an email, I can send you 
information. It's already prepared everything there that uh, uh, how you need to recycle it. But just not only the osmium tetroxide, all the chemicals that we're using here are not healthy. <laughs> I mean, just not on this one. So paraformaldehyde that we also use, we should always use under the hood, not on the open side. And also there are many chemicals that are used under the electron microscopy or the SEM. They have a proper things. I think uh, uh, SEM, we don't use osmium tetroxide. We use it only for the temp, but we also use, I told you, potassium ferromagnet and it also many other. Um, there is again different lecture of that one. But uh, please write me. I will write clearly write just not only most of the but also other things, uh, a proper recycling. It doesn't cost much money anyway. But only because every time that you do, you need to collect these chemicals into a jar or a box or a glass coated one. Okay, and while we are waiting for the next question from the online participants, maybe participants here have any other question? Yeah. Uh, my name is Dayat, and I'm from Faculty of Dentistry. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we try to, in our group research, we try to develop membrane and some publications say that uh, they use a scanning electron microscopy to, to see if the cells attach on the membrane surface. So we want to do it also. Uh, my question is, uh, you've said before that with SAM, we can only see the dead cell, right? Uh, so my question, is it okay on the result part of the publication we we write or, yeah? Uh, we reported that uh, cell can attach or cell are visible or the morphology are visible on the, on, in our membrane surface. Because as I know, uh, the cells will detach from the membrane surface if they are died. Mm. So what we can say in our result about that? Thank yeah, you. I think what you said was absolutely true. When the cell died, they won't attach. So that's the one way, but you know, you fix it, right? You fix all the things, whether the cells are dead or not the dead cells. And before that, you need to do simplification, right? When you do the centrifugation, the dead cells are already gone. So the ones that you have are the only attached ones. So the more you do the centrifugation, because you do from the cell culture, right? And the more you do the centrifugation, you pick a big collection of the tissue. Like you can see like an organoid, a very big structure. And you remove all the supernatant. Then theoretical, you see those cells that are attached. So they should be all the healthy ones. If you take the tissue, there's something different. There is no centrifugation. But from the cells, the more you do the centrifugation, all the apoptotic cells or the dead cells, they are gone. And when you look at it under the microscope in the SEM, then you see those cells that are attaching to the membrane, yes or no. You got it? The more you do the centrifugation, is the better for your question of science research. That means when the cells are attaching to the membrane, then it means these are healthy cells. Okay. Yeah, well. um, Feel free to ask because you know the more just just ask, just ask, just relax and ask. It's better for you. Okay. Uh, Mas Dayat, uh, once more, maybe for make sure that cell attached to the membrane, 
you should manipulate your membrane because only membrane you see usually it's difficult to make the cell attach uh, as we ever have discussion with the group of professor Fasi, we need to make the membrane in the oxygen chamber if i said if I, i'm not mistaken yeah but we, we will check about this one okay so next Thank you very much. A very interesting information. Uh, I just thinking if we do in vitro study and then we want to do uh, time, uh, I just thinking how to cut the sample. Okay. So to know the internal question. structure. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Very good question and very practical one. Uh, the tissue, it goes very easy. I mean, also difficult, but not so difficult as cells. Uh, but for cells, the difficult part comes how you fix it. I think I showed you the aortic endothelial cells where one endothelial cell in the cell culture is attaching to the other one. We have a cell-cell contact. So these cells has to grow on a garden. You do the culture, regular cell culture. Maybe I can send you also the protocol. And then uh, you grow them on the regular way. And you, while embedding them, there is an agar in it. So that it is it feels comfortable, like a resin, like agar. You cook them, yeah, you feel, they feel embedded pretty much. And it's a little bit of, and we know already, in vitro does not reveal in vivo for the time, right? But some, some functional studies, you need to have the cell culture. Otherwise, you cannot work on it. But also problem in cell culture, when the cells are not intact, they behave differently. Like when we are together, we behave different. When you go at home and we're alone, we behave different. And the cells behave healthy when they are intact. It means when you put the cells into the culture and when they are intact, when they have cell-cell communication is there, then they reveal like an vivo. And this is very important when you do the electron microscopy, not isolated cells, rather intact cells. Because when the cells are communicating together, they develop, they transcription occurs, some vesicles, some receptors, they're already on the membrane when they are in contact. So the question to your answer, there is a protocol I will send you with agar coating so that cells stay intact each other. Okay, thank you. My experience when I do in vitro study, I just fix the cell and then then for immunohistochemistry and then uh, examine in the using light microscope. So I don't have experience using them. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, I think uh, in the beginning years, people were asking, we were culturing also uh, with uh, in vitro cell cultures, but uh, when they do not have the intact, the cells behave completely different. And the protein that you're looking at or interest of your question may not work sometimes. We had uh, so many projects and it took so many years to understand why they behave so crazy, why the in vivo results will not work in cell culture when I'm isolating from them directly, but won't work. Yeah, it's a big question, <laughs> six, seven years of the work, but still uh, difficult to sometimes to follow or answer. But uh, these are very minute things which we do not even think or consider, they play a very big role. This is what we understood now. Small thing, but uh, they behave differently. I think for the regular histology also, if you try to do with the intact cells, uh, at least your results are much better. Yeah. Well.
Is there any more question for Professor Karnati? Don't worry about English, yeah? Just feel free to ask. <laughs> I understand. Or you can speak also in your Indonesian language, yeah? Somebody can translate. But important thing is just you speak it out. Anything doesn't matter. And uh, you are the very young or maybe the young faculty. If you wanted to grow or improve, you need to speak on. And this is the best exercise. So there's no more question. <laughs> okay, so I think this already concludes our session today. Uh, before we finish, I would like to uh, read to you about the group for tomorrow's session. Uh, so for the first group, atau group yang pertama, ada Ibu Anidia Nur Hamida. Yeah. Okay, maaf kalau begitu untuk yang grup pertama ada Ibu Sintia Regita Nur Mahesti, kemudian ada Ibu Audrey Tabita Gracia, kemudian ada Ibu Dinda Alivia, kemudian ada Bapak Musin Wicaksono Albakri, dan ada Ibu Tri Wahyu Pangestinsi. Kemudian untuk grup yang kedua ada Bapak Ahmad Habibi, Ibu Anindia Nur Hamida, Bapak Afif Akmal Afkauni. Ibu Windy Sefiarini dan Bapak Muhammad Hidayah Syahrudin. Okay, so thank you so much, Professor Karnati, again for your incredible presentation and discussion for today's meeting. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you, same here. Yeah, we hope that we all here learn a lot of new information and so we will see you and with all of the participants tomorrow with the hands-on session um so take care and we'll see you tomorrow bye thank you oh yeah okay um setelah ini kita akan melakukan sesi foto bersama kepada seluruh partisipan mungkin bisa maju ke depan untuk mengambil foto bersama Uh, mohon maaf sebelumnya untuk partisipan yang online boleh dipersilahkan untuk menghidupkan kameranya karena kita akan mengambil gambar secara virtual Oh, yeah. <laughs> Satu, dua, tiga. Oke, okay, untuk slide selanjutnya. Satu, dua, tiga. Oke, okay, untuk slide yang terakhir. Satu, dua, tiga. Baik, terima kasih. Oh, yeah. Nanti. Nah, baik, untuk semua partisipan dipersilahkan maju ke depan. Untuk partisipan yang masih di dalam Zoom meeting, mohon untuk belum keluar dari Zoom meeting. 
karena kita akan melakukan foto bersama dengan partisipan yang hadir pada acara onsite.